Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonalities. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. My name is Bertine Prevacor West, and I'm delighted to be your host. And today we have with us special guest, Kelly Gretsch Enriquez. She is a nationally certified interpreter. Kelly, please say hello to our listeners. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure having you on. So I'm going to tell everybody a little bit about you. So everyone, Kelly is a CMI Spanish, that's a certified, a nationally certified medical interpreter practicing in the greater Richmond, Virginia area. She studied Spanish and English translation and interpretation at Virginia Commonwealth University, also in Richmond, Virginia. Kelly is currently an independent contractor providing on-site and remote interpretation in both medical and mental health settings. In addition, she advocates for the LGBTQ issues in the interpreter community, as well as language access and other issues that face the predominantly immigrant population she serves. Kelly also produces digital education materials for interpreters and interpreters in training. Kelly, once again, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. It's a pleasure having you with us today. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I am delighted to have you. I'm delighted to have you. And I really um, have been wanting to have you on the show for a while. Um, I belong to a Facebook group that you have, and it is really just such a fantastic and informative group. And I love being a part of that. And it specifically addresses LGBTQ issues. But before we dive further into that, I want you to tell us a little bit about your professional background and your training and what you're doing right now during this season of COVID mm -hmm. in particular. Well, I graduated from VCU in December of 2016. Uh, the program that I went through, so I have my bachelor's in foreign language specializing in Spanish, but there was also this program at VCU that is fantastic. It's the only program of its kind in the state of Virginia called the SETI program, which is a Spanish, English translation and interpretation program. And this is actually taught by a federally certified legal interpreter, but it, the program itself focuses on both medical and legal interpretation. So after graduating, I started volunteering at local free clinics. Actually, while I was still in school, I had my internships at local free clinics, um, a lot of nonprofits. And then I actually started working at a local nonprofit that I believe the patient population was 90% Spanish speaking. So all day, every day, I worked as a uh, bilingual patient advocate. I was, uh, what, what didn't I do? I always, I always said, desempeñé muchos papeles. I carried out many roles. I uh, wore many hats. Uh, I was uh, not only receptionist, diagnostic imaging coordinator, referral coordinator. I was an interpreter. I would do reminder phone calls, everything all day, every day in Spanish. So that really gave me a very solid foundation before I decided, you know what, I want to do interpreting. Interpreting is my passion. It's what I went to school for. And so in, I believe, 2018, I finally started dedicated interpreting. And I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? So what are you doing right now, especially um, as an interpreter working in this era of COVID that we're currently evolving through? So COVID's been a little tough. I was an in-person interpreter. Of course, oh, many interpreting, in-person interpreting assignments are, they're basically non-existent now. I maybe have one or two assignments a week. Mm -hmm. So I switched predominantly to remote interpreting, so video and phone interpreting. 
but I also have been focusing on creating educational materials for interpreters. Uh, just because I've had a lot of people, uh, I, I also am a moderator on another large Facebook group of about six, 7,000 folks in the United States. Wow. And uh, many folks were, were saying things like, you know, oh, I feel out of practice. I, I'm not getting assignments like I used to. I need to practice. I need to make sure that I'm ready to serve these folks because we know it's going to happen. We know we're going to get this surge, which is what we're seeing right now. So that's mainly what I've been doing is creating those educational materials, interpreting remotely, and doing very limited, mostly pediatric, in-person interpretation. Wow. And, you know, just to touch upon something you said, because um, for some of our listeners, they may not be familiar with interpreting. And, and as somebody that was um, a nationally certified healthcare interpreter for over 10 years myself, I still, although I'm retired from that profession, I still have this, this great love for interpreting and interpreters, uh, because I know the work that you do is not only taxing physically, um, but taxing emotionally and mentally as well. So having a pandemic thrust upon us um, in this way, that only adds to the greater stressors that that already existed, right? Are we serving our patients well? Are we, you know, are we up to date with the latest terminology? And as you said, it is practice that makes us perfect. And so with a lot of interpreters, um, well, I, I would dare say for all interpreters, it's a skill like riding a bike. Um, you don't forget, but you can definitely fall out of shape. Right. Definitely get rusty for sure. For sure. For sure. And now with so many of the um just the and, and we'll get to that about your your journey in the diversity and inclusion sphere. Um, but with so many terms that are that are new to many people, you know, um, I especially like the work that you're doing for that and creating, you know, your your YouTube videos, your educational materials, I think is a, a fantastic way to not only ride that bike, right, to keep yourself in interpreting shape in your best form, but to also advocate for the LEP, the limited English proficiency population, and to also help interpreters be at their best, right? Yes. So I commend you on doing that because that's not easy to do, especially when you're dealing with your own challenges and your own stressors um, as we each are during this time. So I really, my hat's off to you because that requires a lot of grit, dedication, and commitment. So thank you for thank doing you. that. No, thank you. And and actually, you touch on something really important, which is uh, in mental health with interpreters. Mm -hmm. I'm actually starting a, a series on my website called the Self-Care Series, where it's, it's a really neglected area of interpretation. And it's a lot of these things are especially coming out now during the pandemic. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm a moderator of a group of about 6,000 interpreters and I've had so many interpreters coming to me with their own emotional uh, needs and, and talking about how they feel. And so I think that's a really neglected area of interpretation. The field of interpreting is self-care. Um, so that's definitely another thing that I'm very passionate about. And it's one, as you said, that is very, very rarely discussed because I always say that interpreters are um, the non-clinical members of the clinical team. And so, you know, having said that, although we're a part of the team, if let's say a patient dies, we don't get that opportunity to decompress as the clinical team would. And so we're kind of left to our own devices as to, well, what do we do now? And if we don't have a strong support system of, let's say, fellow interpreters or people that understand our profession, be it family members or friends, then we, we're left to hold that emotional baggage and process it in whatever way that we can. And sometimes that's not good. That's not good because some of us may not have the best coping mechanisms, right? Um, interpretation is very lonely work. Uh, we touch lives every day. I do believe interpreters save lives. I really say if, if heroes are out there, which I know they are, interpreters are part of that group. And so, you know, what are our heroes doing to protect themselves? Not everybody has a, a coping mechanism that is appropriate and conducive to the situation or the times that we're in, you know? So I think, and I, I'm certain of it, um, you putting out this kind of training for them, this, this open space for discussion, creating the space for them to really explore their feelings and discuss these things, you know, I think it will serve them in, in a, such a beneficial way, such a beneficial way. So I'm looking forward to you rolling that out. That's going to be amazing. Thank you. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, throughout this time, good things are happening. 
right? Yes. <laughs> That's what I want people to always remember that, you know, babies are being born, people are getting married, um, people are, you know, enjoying life as they can. And, and part of that, like for me as well, delving into, you know, my work, having the podcast, like for me, it's been a fantastic experience because I said, why not just have more conversations, right? Yes. Put it out there in the world because we don't know who's listening to us. We don't know how many, you know, people this is going to impact, right? Even people that may not be listening, somebody's hearing this and talking to them about it and yes. having a conversation, right? So I believe that, you know, we make impact where we can and then it benefits us as well. But now let's move on to our next question. So talk to me a little bit about your diversity and inclusion journey and, and kind of what led you to this space. Oh, my goodness. That's I know it's a, a big question, it's, right? It's a big question. Um, I'm just going to start back at the beginning. So I grew up in the middle of nowhere in southern Fauquier County in Virginia. Uh, and a lot of people are very surprised that I don't have a very thick southern accent because of where I come from. There were more cows than people where I grew up. Oh, my God. Um, and unfortunately, I grew up with a lot of, of those isms, racism, sexism, and then you throw in um, just homophobia. I mean, transphobia. I hadn't even heard of trans folks mm -hmm. until I was in college. So a lot of these things were things that I grew up with and I had to unlearn. And you're never a finished product. Mm -hmm. It's You're always going through life and it's always a process. You're always, there's always still something to unlearn. So it, gosh, uh, starting to interpret for me, um, I was working in restaurants uh, with a predominantly Spanish speaking population. I ended up managing Spanish speaking kitchens and it was really my coworkers who taught me Spanish. Um, and so I had that really informal education but it also gave me a lot of insight into what it's like to be an immigrant from Central America here in the United States. And I just completely fell in love with my neighbors. I lived in a Spanish speaking neighborhood. I was, you know, the gringa in the Spanish speaking neighborhood. Everyone knew me as the person who spoke English and the person to come to if they needed something, if they needed help with something. Mm -hmm. And I was always helping. I unfortunately had a near brush with with death uh, in 2011, I was hospitalized for a few days. And that was kind of a, a wake up call for me that, you know, I wanted to do something more with my life. And I decided to go to college and I wanted to be a social worker, but that didn't work out. Uh, VCU doesn't let you combine social work with any other major. And so I was at a crossroads and I said, okay, I have to choose between Spanish or social work. And I said, I'm not leaving my Spanish. Uh -huh. And I decided to take this, uh, this SETI program. I said, I'll just make my Spanish that much better. I'll just focus on my Spanish. And lo and behold, I absolutely loved interpretation. And the fact that the work in and of itself is helping people. Mm -hmm. You're giving a voice to the voiceless. You're letting people who are not able to be heard, be heard. And by understanding these people you're able to more accurately convey what it is that they're trying to say. By having that background of cultural competence, by knowing their experiences, by learning and hearing about their experiences, you're able to more accurately convey and contextualize what it is that they're expressing. So that is in a nutshell, kind of my, my journey. And it's, it's a, it's, um, it's a journey I'm still on. Uh, it's a journey. I'm still, I'm still learning. I'm still unlearning. So, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And that's a beautiful journey. It's, I felt like as you were describing it, that I was there with you, you know? So um, thank you for taking us on that journey. And I love what you said about never being a finished product, right? And I think that's a sign of, of a true leader. I really do, especially when it comes to the field of interpretation and translation, right? There's always more to learn. There's always more where we can, there's always an area where we can grow and expand ourselves, right? And so you having said that, also coupled with a life-altering event, right? Um, because that gives us a different perspective when we're in a hospital room and, and we're the patient, right? And we're going through this, as you said, we're, we're at this place, we're at this crossroads of, okay, the next step I take is going to determine who I become, like really and truly, yes. you know, and, and I dare say, um, I, our stories are, 
are similar in many ways, you know, but that would be another podcast episode, Kelly. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> because we can have several, you and I. <laughs> but I, I really love that. And and I, I'm glad that you shared that that personal story with us because a lot of times people think that this work is easy, that, oh, okay, I'll just speak Spanish, right? But that's not what it is, right? Um, my my friend, our mutual friend, Sean Normansell, um, he is hmm. in the group as well. Um, he had once said something to me um, and Sean and I go back. Um, so shout out to Sean. I know you're listening. <laughs> so we go back many, many, many years. And he had once said to me how, you know, he was also the gringo in the environment, right? And so he learned interpretation through um, working with, you know, fellow other, well, not fellow because he's not, he's not Latino or Hispanic, but um, working with um, his construction crew. And, you know, I think getting exposed to the culture in this way is so wonderful and beautiful. And I love that you made yourself vulnerable by saying what, what you had to unlearn. Right. Because that's also teaching ourselves something. Right. Unlearning things. And and I dare say we all have something to unlearn. Right. But I love that your awareness of it, you know, propelled you to be even better than what you were. Right. Um, Because I think when we when we think about interpreting, like I said, we think about it as chatting, but it's so much more work. And Sean had once said to someone that, you know, they thought he was there to chat. You know, and he said, I'm not here to chat. I'm here to interpret. Right. And it's a skill. It's a skill that has to be learned, perfected. It's a craft that we have to, you know, and you, you notice I still say we because I feel like once you are an interpreter, it's always in your heart. Oh, yeah. You know, like you can't. That's something you never quit. And what I think is phenomenal um, about every interpreter that I've met is that even if we're not in the field anymore, if somebody needs help there we are, we're jumping in there, right? But it also, what I like that you said about going to school for this, it also requires training, right? Education, because um, what's that saying? You can have 10 fingers, but it doesn't make you a concert pianist, right? Mm -hmm. And so people all the time um, used to come up to me and say, because um, as I said, my family is originally from Haiti. I was born here, but I speak the languages of our culture. Um, and so what was interesting is people would say to me, oh, so you're playing around with Creole. That's great. And I, I'm like, no, I literally have to learn things that I never talk about the dinner table. Like at the dinner table, I never speak about, you know, your liver and your heart and your brain mm-hmm. function and the difference between a stroke and, and a heart attack or an arrhythmia, you know? So or low grade yeah. intraepithelial lesions. <laughs> that's, exactly on them. that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So I'm just like, no, this is not chatting. This is your brain yes. functioning in a way that, that is almost unnatural, right? So you have to like make it work out and you have to build those muscles. So now I'm going to dive in to, to more of your inclusion work. So tell us about your Facebook group and your work with the LGBTQ community, because I find it so wonderful, so fascinating, so necessary, and so timely. We've got some exciting news here at the Global Fluency Podcast. As your safety and continued learning remains our top priority, the 2020 Global Fluency Diversity and Inclusion Summit has gone virtual. The Global Fluency Podcast and Westbridge Solutions continue to see this as a time for growth and evolution. Take this opportunity to come join us virtually for our 2020 summit from the comfort of your own home. Going virtual has allowed us to offer all summit attendees tons of additional perks. When you register for the summit, you will receive access to all 12 of our key speakers during this live two-day summit. No need to choose breakout sessions. 30-day access to the replay of the summit with closed captions. Eligibility for SHRM, CCHI, NBCMI, and LPCA CEU credits. And for nonprofit organizations and interpreters, you will receive a special discount when you use code GF202045. Don't delay. Register today at www.globalfluencysummit.com. We look forward to seeing you at the virtual event. Yes, so I started Queer Friendly Interpreters and Translators. It is my goal one day to start a nonprofit uh, focusing on LGBT issues as it relates to the linguist community specifically interpreters and translators, and that page is called Allied Linguists for LGBTQ Language Access. 
Uh, okay, so, so you heard that. So make sure at the end we're going to repeat it so everybody can check yes, it out. I haven't Facebook. been keeping up with it as much as I should have during the pandemic, but please excuse me. The pandemic's been pandemic. difficult. We'll <laughs> yeah. understand. Okay. We'll understand. <laughs> so uh, my main reason for starting the group was I, I'm a member of a lot of interpreting groups on Facebook, and they've been invaluable to me. And I know there's a large interpreter presence on Facebook. And as I've been going previously, when I was going to a lot of in-person assignments, I would have patients divulge to me the negative experiences that they had had with other interpreters with regards to them being part of the LGBTQ community. And it really floored me because some of these interpreters were interpreters that I respected. Mm -hmm. Some were interpreters that I know are professional, are cognizant constantly of the code of ethics, yet they were stepping out of their role as an interpreter and allowing their personal opinions on LGBTQ issues to interfere with their ability to interpret for these patients. Mm -hmm. And that just, it, it floored me. It, it, I'm bisexual myself, which is something I, I'm, I even was kicking myself after I mentioned my whole journey that I didn't mention that I'm bisexual. And that's something that I struggle with is I don't mention that often enough. Mm -hmm. And I think I should mention it more because I am a cisgender woman married to a cisgender man who's heterosexual, but that doesn't make me any less bisexual. Absolutely. Um, and I love that you make that distinction because I think it's very important for people to know. And, and I, I love that you are representing yourself in such an authentic way, um, because I think a lot of times people here are bisexual and they don't envision somebody who's cisgender married to another cisgender person. Right. Mm -hmm. and they're thinking, oh, wait, but but that looks like something you'd see in the suburbs. But why aren't bisexual people represented in the suburbs they mm -hmm. live in there? Right. And yeah. <laughs> suburbs, I mean, cultural suburbs, mental suburbs mm -hmm. along those lines. But do continue. Do continue. Yeah. So uh, it was just I'm one patient in particular sticks out in my mind. And, you know, we were very similar, this patient and I. And the fact that the interpreter had actually decided to not only step out of their role as an interpreter, which is something I had never, ever imagined that interpreter to do, given their professionalism to step outside of their role as an interpreter and then to proceed to recite religious texts oh, no. in defense of their position. And if you're coming from that position as an interpreter, you're supposed to be neutral. You're supposed to interpret everything accurately and completely. And it doesn't matter whether you agree with what your patient is saying, you interpret it. If, you're, if your patient uh, has done something that you find morally reprehensible, doesn't matter what it is, you still interpret for that patient. Absolutely. I've had, I've had patients who, you know, have perpetrated acts of violence against other people. And as a survivor of domestic violence, I find that reprehensible, but I will still interpret for that patient because that patient, that is their right for me. And it is my job as a professional to interpret everything accurately and completely. So that just, it really floored me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, whenever I would speak up about gender neutral language or the inclusion of, you know, the third person singular pronoun AJ in Spanish. Mm -hmm. It was met with such vitriol by some people on these inter these professional interpreter forums. Mm -hmm. And it just, it really, it rubbed me the wrong way. And so I decided I, we need a space. We need a space, a safe space for interpreters who are dedicated to this code of ethics that we have, inclusive of the LGBTQ population, we need to have this space. And I wanted to invite not just interpreters who were, quote unquote, queer friendly, but also I, I invited members of uh, the LGBTQ community as well. So I've, I've invited family members, I've invited friends, folks who I've had conversations with about LGBTQ issues. And I wanted to make it a place where interpreters who are curious to learn about terminology and their target language to be able to safely ask questions. And instead of having to sort through a hundred hateful comments, just get straight to the point. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if anyone has a question, I want someone to feel comfortable asking that question. 
And I don't want other people in the group to say, well, that's, you know, that's a horribly insensitive question. You're a horrible person. Mm-hmm. I would like people to point out, you know, that question is, is, an, is an insensitive way to ask that question. But here, let's rephrase this question. Let's, let's learn about this together. I, I want us to, to get better. I want us to learn together. So that's the long and the short of it, pretty much the long of it, but... <laughs> No, that's that's the that's the totality of it, which I think is fantastic. And I love that um, you invited not only queer friendly interpreters, right, um, but uh, people that were of the population that we are discussing. Um, the deaf community has a saying, and I'm paraphrasing this right now, but um, if they let's see, I want to say it as correctly as possible. If it doesn't include them they're not a part of it. So essentially, you know, you can't have um, any sort of forum or organization that's serving or claiming to serve a particular group if that particular group isn't a part of the active discussion, Mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, for all of our our, um, deaf and hard of hearing community that are reading uh, this podcast in closed captions, I hope I paraphrased it accurately, (laughs) but but I do feel that way as well about so many groups, Um, people talking about a group, advocating for a group, but that group is not represented within that group that's discussing them, right? So that's another reason why I find your Facebook group um, so powerful, so necessary, and as I said, so timely, uh, because there is no shaming of somebody asking a question, right? But better, you're teaching people how to ask that question going forward, Mm -hmm. right? It's it's similar. I liken it to um, when people would say to me, you know, they would see my name and they're like, oh, but where are you from? And I'm like, uh, I was born here in America, right? And then they're like, no, but really, mm-hmm. right? Like, what, what does that mean, right? And so, you know, I always identify as Haitian American because mm-hmm. um, this way I have my ethnicity in there and my nationality. But still that question is like, really? But where else, right? Depends yeah. on the hairstyle that I have that day. And I'm like, okay, I can't get more niche mm-hmm. down than that. But, <laughs> but you know, I'm like, no, it's okay. But, um, you know, I really love the space that you've created and, and really just the, what I particularly love, love seeing within that group is the diversity of thought, because people tend to link a group with one frame of thought, because you can have conservative, you know, trans people, you can have, you know, right, left wing, right wing gay people, you can have just everyone. So diversity of thought, I think, is so important in every group, because to do otherwise would would state that every member of the LGBTQ community is or every LGBTQ experience is a monotonous one, right? And, and so I'm just like, but we're not. Just like Black people, uh, there's no Black experience in my opinion because are you are, are you Latino? Are you Hispanic? Are you you know fill in the blank? Are you from the Caribbean? Like there's no one experience, and because Black people vary insofar as their life experiences, how we look, how we speak. I spoke different languages from my Black friends growing up. So what does that mean? My experience wasn't their experience, right? I I have an experience of a mono, not a monolingual person, a a multilingual person. So what does that mean? So it's very different. And then within the LGBTQ community, what I particularly love seeing, right, was that, um, you know, people are different languages were represented. So it wasn't just for Spanish, even though that was very necessary. But I love seeing other languages also play a part in that. So that was fascinating. And to touch upon... Um, the point that you made about interpreters who are highly skilled, highly trained, highly respected, they too are in need of this education. And, and mm-hmm. I've experienced that in my own interactions where you'll see an interpreter bring about religious conversation. And I'm like, well, why would people assume that somebody who is a member of the LGBTQ community not be a person of faith? Like that's mm-hmm. a huge assumption. Right. And, and that always as a person who is a Catholic Christian person, that offended me because mm-hmm. if we're going to if we're going to be Christ like, you know, for those that are Christian, that's not a Christ like thing to do. Right. So I'm always I'm always like this is where the human part, the fallible human part in us comes in. And that's yes. the part that we have to check at the door. Right. Mm -hmm. I would just think, what if this was someone that person loved? And so that's when empathy should play a part as well. Right. But again, we can go on (laughs) on, (laughs) on forever. But then I want to ask you this. So with regard to political correctness. Right. How does that play a part? Um, Because 
I believe political correctness is inaccurate because as interpreters, we're tasked to, as one of our code of ethics, we're tasked to be accurate, right? So I always welcome a different opinion if there is one, but what is what, what do you feel that role of political correctness plays in your work, if any? Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in-person and online, live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www.westgrouptraining.com or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Oh my goodness. That's a tough question. I think I have to interpret everything accurately and completely. I have to interpret something as it's said. And I've had some patients say some really ugly, not politically correct things before that I've had to interpret. Mm-hmm. I've had racially charged things that I've had to interpret towards people of other races from a patient, um, which is a very strange position for me to be in as a white person hurling racial insults at someone. It, it's 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 a very uncomfortable position to be in that I would never want to find myself in. But as a professional, that's my job. Right. So that's not to say that political correctness should be thrown out the window. Um, I, I definitely think that in my own personal conduct, I need to be uh, considerate of, of everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, However, when we're talking about linguistic issues, I think it's important to frame questions as that questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, If someone says this, insert politically incorrect thing here, how do you interpret this? And I think that's a completely valid question for someone to ask as an interpreter. Mm -hmm. However, the spaces in which we ask those questions and the manner in which we ask those questions needs to be asked in such a way that it's not harmful in the space that we're asking it. Um, I have asked in my group, um, career friendly interpreters and translators, that if someone does use uh, a disparaging term or slur towards a member of the LGBTQ community, I mean, really anyone, if it's if it's a racially charged slur, anything along those lines, to put it under a cut or to warn people like, hey, this post is going to contain some slurs mm-hmm. and Slurs for some people can bring up some really, really, really horrible feelings. Sure, true. Um, Sure. Yeah, definitely. And and I think that needs to be recognized. But as linguists, we still need to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So I definitely, in the group, I don't want people to come into my group and just see slur after slur after slur and just feel horrible inside. I, that is not at all what I want. I want that space to be a space where people can feel comfortable to come and to express themselves and to answer questions. So it's, it's one of those fine lines. It's, a, it's kind of a gray area, uh, which I think as a linguist, it's a little bit more difficult to na- navigate. Um, but I, it, it just brings me back to uh, my university program. Um, my professor, oh my goodness, I love this woman. A Colombian American woman, and uh, she is, of course, a federally certified interpreter, and she has to interpret for some pretty crazy cases sometimes. And we were reading a script once, and there was a there was a, a bad word in the script, and every student that would read this would kind of shy around this bad word, <laughs> and she said, "No, as an interpreter, you have to interpret everything accurately and completely." Absolutely. And I kid you not, we were asked at that point to repeat bad words. Yes. Loudly and together yes. as a class. I love it. I love and it. I know I love it because honestly, I will not mince words here. I swear like a sailor in my personal time, 
<laughs> so it was not it was not an issue for me, but you would see some of my classmates and they would be have a very uncomfortable look on their face and their cheeks would flush red and they were yelling bad words. And I just thought it was the funniest thing, but it, it was a necessary exercise. I love and, it. And it, you know, if if you're in court, it, she said this, if you're in court and you have a defendant calling the judge a bastard, you're not going to say, you know, oh, um, judge, you're a, an idiot. No, right. because that's going to affect how the judge treats this defendant, how the judge sentences the defendant. So you, you have to, you have to. Don't, and don't, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> right, exactly. Don't shoot the messenger, everyone. <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. I could not agree with you more. And you're reminding me of when I was an interpreter trainer, um, there was a group that I was training. And for some reason, and I, I shouldn't say for some reason, they were visibly uncomfortable at having to say parts of the body. And mm-hmm. so I, but, but using slang words for them. Right. Mm. And so I'm just like, look, you've got to say these words because they're just words, but they're your tools. If I'm a plumber, I'm not going to show up at your house to fix your sink without my tool belt and my toolkit. Mm. Right. Because then why am I even there? Right. I'm not going to achieve the goal set. So there was I gave everybody a word to say and I made sure to give um, women, you know, parts of the male anatomy and all these slang mm-hmm. terms and men parts of the female anatomy. And they had to get up stand up and say them to the point where it just became a word. And so yes. before every class, I'd be like, what's your word? And they would just get up and say whatever word that is. And what was interesting was if somebody, if a lay person had just walked into the classroom, they'd be like, mm-hmm. what is happening here? <laughs> but having said that, now those words are not an obstacle. I love that yes. your professor told you that. I really do. So now, Kelly, as we're preparing to wrap up, what are two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners? Ooh, I know I this, is, this is this is one of those. Uh, oh my goodness! Um, this is one definition. of those um, lightning questions. <laughs> yes, uh, definitions vary. Mm. I think that's important, especially when it comes to the LGBTQ community, because what is bisexual for one person? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna stick with what I personally identify with. I'm not going to presume to speak on you know other identities or issues mm-hmm. that I don't belong with or identify with. Mm -hmm. Um, just because that's not my place. But bisexual, for instance, there are many people that say bisexual is inherently transphobic. And Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that has actually been a big focus of my group is trans inclusion Mm -hmm. um, and non-binary inclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, I make sure that every single person who joins my group explicitly agrees to the rules. And one of those rules is there is a T in LGBTQ. Right. There is a T. Mm -hmm. Because there are many members of the LGBTQ community who are just fine with, you know, lesbians, gays, uh, you know, fine with everyone, bisexual people, um, pansexual people. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to trans folks, it's just there's a tremendous amount of transphobia. But uh, and, and that's why definitions vary, because there are some people who purposely identify as bisexual because recognizes the gender binary and only adheres to the gender binary. I am only attracted to folks assigned female at birth, cisgender folks, cisgender females. I am only attracted to cisgender males. That is not my definition of bisexual. My definition of bisexual and a close friend of mine who is also bisexual and non-binary, our definition that we share together as friends is that I am attracted to my gender and I am attracted to people of another gender. It can be any other gender. Um, So that's very much in keeping with the definition that many folks have for pansexual. But Mm -hmm. see, for me, pansexual was a term that came out way after I found out that I was bisexual. Mm -hmm. So I just don't identify with that term. That doesn't mean I don't recognize its validity. And that doesn't mean that there, there isn't more than one definition of pansexual. Um, because I'm sure there are many folks with different definitions. And uh, so that, that's the first one. <laughs> that's a big one. I'm sorry. Uh, no, there are more, there's more than one definition. You just blew um, my mind with that because that is something being a cisgender heterosexual woman who is queer friendly, you know, I never even considered that because that's so outside of my scope, right? And so to to know that there's this 
transphobia that exists within what is supposed to be an inclusive group of people, mm-hmm. right? Like that to me is is mind blowing, but then you'd find that happening in, in other inclusive groups as well, right? So thank you for, for shedding light on that. And then what's the second one? The second one, I'm just gonna go with it because I think it's something really important, uh, mm-hmm. especially in the current political climate, transgender folks. It's not something that you can agree with or disagree with. Trans folks exist. Mm. I, I see so many folks who, so, so many people who say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, it doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. Trans people exist. Non-binary people exist. You can't invalidate someone's existence. And, and I think that's important because a, a lot of times, it, it's so strange, the cognitive dissonance. You see policies coming out that are actively anti-trans. Yes. Yet at the same time, a lot of the same people who are proponents of these policies are the same people who will say, oh, well, I don't agree with that. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with it. And it's like, well, it's not something to, it, you're, you're proving my point here. It's not something to agree or disagree with. Mm-hmm. Trans folks exist. And yeah. our responsibility as interpreters is if we have someone who is trans, non-binary, lesbian, gay, pansexual, bisexual, asexual, intersex, regardless, if that person is the person we are in charge of interpreting for, whatever comes out of their mouth, we have to interpret. So it doesn't matter whether you agree Mm -hmm. with the gender neutral day. It doesn't matter. You have to interpret it. It's very simple at the end of the day. It really is. And I think that's something that just it gets lost in all this is, is it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. It, it just is. And it's our job as interpreters to interpret. Wow. That, I couldn't have thought of a better way to wrap up the show. Kelly, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I knew we were going to have great conversation, but it was super great. It was wonderful Aww. and so informative. And again, I appreciate the work that you do and really to not only educate interpreters and specifically queer family interpreters, but everyone, everyone, because interpreters go talk to other people. They talk to their family, their friends, mm-hmm. you know, their loved ones. So, and some to their plants, but <laughs> <having said> that, <laughs> I talked to you know, my cat. It's okay. It's absolutely, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so having said that, I want to thank you truly and deeply for expanding the conversation, for enlightening me during this conversation, um, and really enlightening our listeners, uh, because I know that no one's going to come away with this, like, oh, I knew all of that, right? Um, so thank you for, for <laughs> keeping it clear and, and just keeping it, you know, authentic. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you too. Thank you so much for inviting me on this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now tell everybody where they can find you on social media. My goodness, what don't I have on social media? Um, so my website is kghinterpretation.com. So that's Kelly Gretsch Henriquez interpretation.com, kghinterpretation.com. So you can find most of my social media on there. Uh, I am also on Twitter. Uh, so that's KGH Interpret. I'm on Facebook as Kelly Gretsch Henriquez. I also have my interpretation page on Facebook, KGH Interpretation on Facebook. Uh, I'm also on YouTube. Uh, my YouTube is actually youtube.com slash C slash Kelly Gretsch Henriquez. My name is so hard. I'm so sorry. Uh, it has a silent Z in it. So it's going to be K-E-L-L-Y, G as in girl, R, R, Z as in zebra, E as in elephant, C as in cat, H, another H, E as in elephant, N, R, I, Q, U, E as in elephant, Z as in zebra, goodness gracious. Uh, so if you have any doubts about any of those links, you can always go to my website, kghinterpretation.com. Click on the link at the top that says subscribe and all of my social media will be listed there. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. And we'll also have it um, when we have the video of the podcast that comes out on YouTube with our closed captions as well. So once again, Kelly, thank you so much for being on the Global Fluency Podcast. It was wonderful to have you on the show. 
Thank you so much, Bertine. It was lovely to be on your show. Awesome, awesome. And for all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. And remember, this is your podcast. So send us your thoughts, your ideas, your comments. If there's an episode uh, that you'd like for us to air, if there's a topic you'd like for us to discuss, we are your podcast. So let us know. You can also find us um, at info at westgrouptraining.com, the the sponsor of the Global Fluency Podcast. And I encourage you all to keep the conversation going. Until next time, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences, leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going, going, going.